what exactly is meant with what the focus is of uh, meeting on the pursuit of justice. Uh, well, that's what I was wondering when I first heard the title. I got emailed up by John Mullen. He said, will you speak about the pursuit of justice? I said, okay. That was months ago. Uh, it was on Thursday, I emailed him. Thursday, I, on Thursday, I emailed John back and said, well, what exactly do you mean by the pursuit of justice? Uh, because it's very, both a very broad and a very narrow concept. It's very broad and, of course, uh, everything that we've been discussing this weekend could be called part of a fight for justice. Uh, so it's so broad as a, almost to defy precise description. On the other hand, it's very narrow in that justice is a single concept really as well. And uh, when we think about justice in society, we can to mean how, uh, how citizens are treated by the system of justice, by the courts and by the police, whether individuals and individual families or groups of people can find justice. Uh, and a sense of fairness in society. And so, I mean, I was thinking about those two different definitions as I had to uh, uh, when thinking of what to say uh, at the meeting. And it struck me that the reason why these two things are the same, and this is not a very original thought, you know, but it struck me, is that every campaign for justice actually brings up an awful lot of broad considerations, broad political uh, uh, considerations. Uh, they may not, and that may not be the focus of individual campaigns when people, whether it's in Ireland or England or anywhere else, are out to get the truth and get some sort of closure is the modern uh, psychological word for uh, this, but a sense or that, I, that, a, a, that the wrong done to them has, to the extent possible, been put right. Uh, when people are directly involved in those things, they tend to focus on that and nothing else, and that's okay. That's okay if you've lost sort of a member of your family. Uh, that is what you want the truth about. That is you want, what you want justice for, sort of rather than sitting down and considering the unjust nature of capitalist society. Uh, and as I say, that's the only reason you have for campaigning for justice. That's a good enough reason, as far as I'm concerned. <coughs> but when you actually meet people, who are struggling for justice, sort of in relation to issues that on the face of it have very little to do with wider society. And it's my experience over the years that when you talk to them, and not for very long, when you talk for two or three minutes, you will find that they have drawn wider conclusions, whether or not that are they express it in a political context or join a political uh, organization. They understand that they're dealing sort of, with something more and something broader than the circumstances in which they became bereaved or the, the feeling of injustice developed. Let me give you a very simple example, something that at first sight doesn't appear to have any real sort of broad political uh, uh, relevance. So when a family in West Donegal, you know, just beyond Bonnie Buffet, if you're on the road from uh, Derry, some years ago, well, uh, in 2009, maybe 2008, their daughter, who's a teacher, 27 years old, was driving home at night, her car crashed and she was killed. Now there, I was going to say dime a dozen, that's too disrespected, but you, you know, that that's not, a, sadly, a, a, a very unusual uh, event, and particularly in Donegal, which has got the highest level of deaths by road accidents uh, of uh, any county. Uh, now what happened, as it turned out, is that this woman and her father and mother said she's a very careful driver. She couldn't have gone into uh, that stretch of road which wasn't a sort of a sharp bend, a little bend on it. Uh, she wouldn't have gone in at a dangerous speed. That's not the type of person she was. Be very careful. Uh, so what's happened here? So they went to take a look at the road. The road, um, just shortly after, to give them the day after she could kill, and they saw, and talking to the local people, that the road had changed. The road had changed from the previous night. That the previous night, there were no warning signs leading up to this stretch of road, which had been newly out of a, a tar of a cannon and a layer of stones, as is normal, pebbles or whatever they are, sort of, I mean, put on top of it. Loose gravel was on top of it. The next morning, there were warning signs there, which hadn't been there. There were days when all the local people said, no, county council, council workmen came out early in the morning before dawn, and they had been seen placing these things uh, uh, there. The county council denied all responsibility for anything. The family of father and mom 
that it took up in this cause began writing to TDs, to senators, to county councillors, to anybody else that they could find. Now, when they went to court in the first instance, they found that the county council had entered the lists against them, denied responsibility, denied that they were a party to this sort of said in the court case, and subsequently the uh, inquest couldn't look into any rule for uh, the county council because this was a road traffic accident and what matter was, what speed was the person going at, whether there was something coming in the other direction, did the license, all those things. They said, and maybe none of those were true, an accident means uh, an accident. And they, it was discovered then, and this came as a great surprise to me at the day, that no members of the council supported this attitude by the council. None of them. It was the county manager, a man called McLoon, brother of the guy who used to be the manager of the Donegal Gaelic team, if you remember, brother of the guy who was the secretary of the Irish Congress trade, of trade unions, a very prominent and powerful family, uh, uh, the McLoons. Um, and the county manager said no and told the council when people objected to the council meetings, not your business, this is a matter looked at subsection such and such of the local government act or uh, whatever it was. As a result of that, the family went on a long campaign and if you talked, and it's not over, it's by no means over, and if you talk to them now, these are non-political people, they say the county manager was corrupt, the guards are corrupt. Everybody in official who dealt with us is corrupt. The insurance companies are corrupt. They are all liars. We don't trust any of them anymore. Now, they don't, as a result of that, sort of they're a coach, sort of an ordinary family, never been involved in politics. They don't run out, sort of, and decide that they're going to become revolutionaries and want to overthrow the state. But they have drawn conclusions about what happened to their daughter, which go well beyond the question of the human rights of their daughter and of their family to vindication and for justice. Goes well beyond that. Let me give you another example. I was in, uh, spent quite a lot of time in London in 2002-2003, uh, I think it was, started when the tribunal, the inquiry into Bloody Sunday, moved over to London because soldiers said that if they gave evidence of Derry where it was supposed to be, that their lives would be in danger. Actually, they would have been the safest soldiers ever to walk the streets of Derry because everybody would have known, don't touch these guys, we'll spoil the case. Uh, uh, I, but then it's just going to go to London. So off we went to London, we were there for, what, over a year? There were four sessions for whatever they are, sort of what maybe they call court sessions, sort of, uh, over about a, a year and four months in London. And during that time, there's a number of meetings held. Obviously, loads of families over, usually about 40, 50 members of the Bloody Sunday families, over in London, some of them never missed sort of a session, whether in Derry or uh, in London. So there's lots of meetings held. So mainly sort of the Camden Irish Centre and so on, local committees with organised meetings, where a couple of members of the families come up. I spoke at a number of these meetings. One of them was in the very plush and prestigious surroundings of the Institute of Contemporary Arts. So anybody who knows sort of that sort of scene will know that it's on the mall, sort of in that broad road that leads sort of up to Buckingham Palace. Sort of a wonderful white sort of building with columns and all the rest. Terrific building. Don't know why I'm saying that, except that it's one of my favourite buildings. And it's saying it's terrifically kitted out as an arts gallery. They had a meeting in there, and I went down, sort of with, I forget which member, sorry, because they spoke at so many meetings, so I would speak with a member of the families and address whoever turned up. And as we stood up to speak, you looked out in the audience, and you could see that an awful lot of them were London Irish people. Now, I'm not saying London Irish people look differently than anybody else, but I knew some of them. I knew some of them sitting there, I just knew sort of way. A lot of them were London Irish uh, uh, people, a lot of them were the Bloody Sunday families. And up in the corner in the back, there's this group of about maybe 12 to 15 people. They looked very much out of place. They were sort of, if you'll excuse the expression, respectable English working class people, dressed as if for a Sunday uh, event. And you see immediately, those are not London Irish, and they're not certainly not members of the Bloody Sunday families. Who are they? There, and we both spoke the round of the Bloody Sunday, one well, of the Bloody Sunday dead, and myself, and very first when the chair said, anybody comment for the way, what are these people put their hands on? I stood up and said, excuse me, I'm a member of the Marchioness families. Now, I don't know if any of the Marchioness of that word has any resonance now at all with anybody. The Marchioness was a pleasure boat on the Thames. You could hire it out sort of for uh, parties in the evening, sort of our companies uh, having a lunchtime, winding, or whatever it was, or just for pleasure. People went up and down the stand in the south bank of the Thames today, you'll see pleasure boats 
going up and down. Now, there was a party on this uh, a pleasure boat. It was going up the Thames, and it was at a collision with the smaller boat. It turned turtle. Turned turtle within sight of the shore. 15 to 20 people drowned there. Now, this was just for a few yards, because the Thames isn't a very broad river. So it was no broader than the Liffey. So I wish if you come from Derry and know the foil, you regard the Liffey as a sort of rivulet. You know, sort of, and it's, uh, uh, uh. so it was the Thames, sort of, but that only emphasizes sort of, the fact that there was something strange going on here. How could this uh, uh, vessel capsize in this narrow stretch of water when there's no tide or no waves or anything like that? So the families wanted to know. So they went along to the coroner, they went along to the courts, they went along to the police, they went along to the upper runs the river, the river police, and whatever they are, and asked for the documents. Can you tell us what happened? Why did this happen? No answers. No answers at all. Nobody would answer them. The police said they didn't know. That it was just it's a maritime accident, as they called it. How would we understand uh, a, what had happened? This was a few years before, maybe three years before, the meeting at the Institute of Contemporary Arts. They said the same thing. We know what you feel. We know what you're going through. This is a group of people from Derry who were complaining about the parachute regiment which people, ordinary people in England, so to speak, are supposed to be, and we are told, holds in the highest regard. You know, as an elite regiment of the British Army. He said, we know what happened to you. Uh, and this is Hapel, thanks. Uh, 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 we know what happened to you uh, uh, because we've gone through the same thing. We support you all the way. Now, isn't that very odd on the face of it? Yet it's not very odd. We think about it a bit more, because what they're dealing with is what the state did to them. What the state, how the state compounded their grief and their sense of, of, of grievance. Sort of by refusing to listen to them and refusing to charge anybody. Now, of course, it turns out that this boat is owned by very powerful people in the city of London. It's very important to the London tourist trade and all the rest of it. Sort of in hand. Sort of an inquest or an inquiry, they'd never got sort of a, 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 a formal inquiry like the Bloody Sunday a families one. Had such an inquiry been held, and they said sort of there's culpable negligence here, for a start, culpable negligence is a, a culpable negligence is a crime. Would they have charged anybody? It also would have been devastating for uh, a, the reputation sort of of the river authorities as when was that post last inspected? No information on that. Who inspected it? What was the result? Was a certificate uh, issued? Uh, no sign of certificates and no explanation of why not. So these families understood the Bloody Sunday families. And what is more, so that I could run through all that, you know, sort of a people killed in custody, sort of in, in British jails. Everybody knows that. A thousand people have died in police custody in England. Not in England, Scotland and Wales. In England, a thousand people have died since the day of Bloody Sunday, since the early 1970s. Number of cops charged, three or four. Number of cops who served time in jail, there's actually two who served five months each. They were two people who murdered a man called David Orawali, if I pronounced his name uh, correctly, in Hull. Jonathan, two police were charged with that. But you run through your list, I've got the name all wrong. There's a man called Christopher Alder. I've got David Orawali came much later. Christopher Alder in Hull was murdered by the police and two, two cops in 1969 served uh, uh, about, five, they served about five and a half months in jail uh, for that. After that, nobody, a thousand deaths, nobody at all. And some of you read the socialist papers and so on, you can remember some of the names one was. Daniel Alawali, uh, Sean Rigg, uh, there's a guy sort of killed, sort of shot dead in uh, East London, Harry Stanley. So he was a perfectly innocent man going home on a Sunday afternoon. I talked to his wife and spoke to his wife with his wife on platforms afterwards. They were fanatical Glasgow Rangers supporters, which took me aback. You know, sort of a thing. Uh, 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 and they, all of them, all of them, said the same thing. We were met with a wall of sand. They told us lies. We're still having the fight. We still get that grief. It's like sand peppering our heart every time we think about it. Uh, they hate it. The cops, they all hated the state. Well, it's a road accident in Donegal. I could go over uh, loads of uh, uh, examples in Dublin. At one point during the initial controversy over that killing, it coincided sort of, with the publication of the Mahan Report. Was that what it was? Sort of into uh, the police uh, uh, in Donegal, and that was sparked by uh, the killing of a man called Richie Barham in Rafoe. 
Do you know what I mean? Uh, uh, and Frank McBrady, who uh, ran a nightclub, there then Ruffalo, was charged with it and was fitted up by cops who investigation showed were drunk at the time. It's two o'clock in the morning, they'd been drinking in another bar in the town. And then verbal and told lies, sort of in uh, uh, sworn statements. But anyway, sort of that gave rise to uh, uh, he was an inquiry into the cops there, and uh, uh, the family, the McBrady family, fought a very strong fight, sort of with supporters in uh, Donegal. The point is this in the midst of all that, Sir Frank McBrady, in his nightclub, in Rafo, organised a meeting and just put out a call that anybody who had similar grievances to come along and they tried to do a concerted focus campaign about the police, about insurance companies, about road traffic accidents. I was at the meeting. So was Donald McCarry. I don't know if he's here. I remember sort of a uh, uh, Donegal man. Sort of it was up at him. We had 17 families from all over Ireland. All of them had grievances about road traffic accidents, about insurance companies, like about the cops cooperating in cahoots with insurance companies to minimise sort of the responsibility which is going to be attributed uh, to county councils uh, mainly. You have never been at an angrier meeting as one after the other they stood up and recited what had happened to them. All of them said, you can trust nobody in authority in this country. Our TDs are useless. They promise us to take up these things, then they don't. The newspapers are useless. are useless. County councils are useless. They are all useless. They are all liars when it comes to dealing with the police. In other words, they began to hate the machinery of the state and to understand that the machinery of the state is not there to vindicate the rights of ordinary people and or ordinary families. Now that is a conclusion, to come to the conclusion that it's not individual instances of injustice that we are dealing with here. Whether it's a shot from security forces or an uncovered road that they end, an untreated road that they then uh, 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 lie about afterwards. That in all these cases, everybody understood so that there were great forces at work once they thought about it for five seconds. So they had understood this once they saw the way that they were being treated. Now that's a revolutionary conclusion. It really is. They say that the machinery of the state, that the parliament, the upper echelons of civil service, the lower echelons of civil service, their tame press and the rest of it, that they're all on the same side and it's not our side. Now very few people, as I said at the beginning, very few people in this situation, generalise from their particular circumstances, which are intensely personal to them uh, uh, and their families. They don't come up in the mind, initially, sort of as broad issues. And even when those conclusions are drawn, People initially, and I'm not being patronising here, I'm basing this sort of on, on the, uh, uh, just on meeting people, and meeting a lot of them uh, uh, over the years. Uh, and it seems to me sort of that you could feed people pamphlets about the nature of the state for years and get them to uh, read it. And they wouldn't be as convinced that the state and the machinery of the state is alien to them and doesn't represent them as they were by these incidents that happened to them. Now, I'm not saying sort of, that that means that you can simply organise and merge all. Sort of, they say, although I think that a better effort could have been done sort of, at the time of the McBrady meeting, sort of, when there were the 17 families from around Ireland were there, but I understand sort of, that people really want sort of, their own grievance uh, a settled. What I'm saying is that there's an issue of justice there, which when contemplated and when analysed in individual circumstances, leads very quickly, very quickly indeed, to generalise conclusions about the nature of the state that we live in. And then you can, when you reach that stage, so you can look at the way the state has reacted. Look at the way at every stage. It isn't that the state is complacent, that it sort of takes the view that whoever's in power, whoever's in charge, sort of, is to be defended, and people complaining about them are to be ignored and insulted. It isn't that. It isn't that, sort of, we look at what the state sort of is doing. It's political. It's all political. It's political about defending the reputation of the Gardaí. Because they defend, depend on the Gardaí, don't they? It's about sort of the, uh, a, a vindicating sort of the uh, performance sort of in the position of TDs, of county managers, of all the rest of it. It is about defence of the state. In other words, what I'm talking about is that the ruling class also understands that what's at issue here is not simply individual cases of, uh, of uh, uh, grievance and responsibility. It's far broader than that. 
And if everybody else understands that he's involved, this is not, you frequently find that this is a good thing, a positive thing. Yeah. So that in left-wing newspapers and socialist workers and, sort of, and the many others, so that you do find causes being taken up. But they're taken up sort of this individual, this is a terrible thing which has happened, you're getting the audience to emphasize. As I say, if that's the only reason you have to campaign, that's a good enough reason for me, but it's not the end of it. It's hardly even the beginning of it when you're talking about the political uh, implications uh, uh, of all this. The nature of the political response to the denial of rights, sort of an idea sort of with reference to the subject I know better in these matters than anything else, the bloody Sunday. Now, if many of you people sort of will understand, most people do sort of understand or believe, sort of they mean that this bloody Sunday issue was settled. Sort of in 2010, when on the 15th of June 2010, Lord Saville published a report and said basically all these people who were shot were innocent. And that's the end of it. Great cheering and all uh, uh, about it. Uh, 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 you know, he said, well, you're satisfied now, let's call an end to uh, this campaign. Of course, that's not good enough for some. Sort of the Bloody Sunday family is not good enough for me. But I believe that if you say that uh, 13 people or 14 when somebody died later, uh, uh, 14 people have been killed and another 13 wounded and an official inquiry declares that they're all innocent immediately another question arises if they're all innocent why were they killed and now that they have been killed what do you call unlawful killing and that's the finding it's either in law it's either manslaughter or murder that's what it is there's nothing else that can be so if an official inquiry finds people guilty of manslaughter or murder what happens in the normal course of events well, you're right. you go to trial, you're arrested, and you go to trial, and you're charged with these offences. Nobody has been charged in relation to Bloody Sunday. And not only that, actually, I firmly believe that one of the reasons for this is that they're rather frightened that if they did charge one of the parties who fired a shot, this guy, who presumably is now in his early 60s or something like that, will think, well, think to himself, where am I taking the rap for this? Sure, I was only doing what I was ordered to do. There's the man that sent me to Derry and told me to go in and teach these people a lesson. And he'd be a rather higher person than a corporal or a, a, a private or a lance corporal on the ground so on. So you can see sort of the, there's a reason, there's political reasons on the way they're not uh, pursuing it. And I'll go into, if anybody wants, in some of the detail as to where that inquiry was led, or rather not led, uh, led sort of in why it's uh, not proceeding uh, at the moment. Even more interesting, look at this for a bit. I'll actually jump around, I, I, I look quickly sort of at the time that I have. Uh, uh, at responses in Southern Ireland to Bloody Sunday. And you see immediately the politics of something which is simply an atrocity, in which uh, 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 everybody in the South of Ireland seems in politics, all political parties were absolutely horrified by this Bloody Sunday uh, massacre. They all poured up over the border. I've got a list somewhere here, written down sort of, of all the people who uh, went up to Derry sort of from the south, if I can find it, quickly enough so as not to delay. I mean, it's a most impressive list of, of people who, uh, uh, I just see a list there of it, let me come back to this briefly, of the people who marched in Dublin. People say now there were three days of mourning after Bloody Sunday. There were not three days of mourning. There was a general strike, sort of, in the Republic. That's what happened. The demonstrations and marches were called almost invariably around Ireland by trades councils and areas, and headed by trade union banners. And that reminded of that just by a sort of little list of the people who marched sort of through Dublin. So sort of the first was led by 500 workers from the Hammond Lane Group of the Blue Bell Estate. So it was followed by the entire workforce of Beamish and Crawford and James Street. Then sort of the Electrical and Engineering Union with a thousand people behind it, including a big contingent from Murphy Structural Engineers, whoever they are. 120 then from the Agricultural Institute, Civil Servant. Several hundred from the Astro Nicholas family in Walkenstown, a contingent from Booth Pool and Company at Island Bridge, 500 agricultural students from UCD led by their uh, student union banner. The point that I'm making, sort of, is that initially after it, there was sort of a trade union led, sort of vigorous campaign, sort of being fought, including uh, in Dublin. And that seemed at the time when the motion was high, and it could go on, sort of, by the, uh, uh, the trade conscious was called demonstrations where Cork, Limerick, Dublin, Waterford, Galway, Kilkenny, Drogheda, Sligo, Clonmel, and Wexford. In each of those, it was the Trades Council which called people out. Nobody remembers that, hardly anybody, because immediately all that started, Jack Lynch, the Taoiseach at the time, announced that we'd have a prolonged period of mourning. And they called for 
dignified mourning across the water. So a, a general strike, and this is the devil we talk about the size of demonstrations, anybody who was around at that time, and who I was a reporter at the time, I remember driving sort of uh, from Dublin up along the border, sort of uh, uh, on the day after the bloody Sunday killing. I could say, nothing moved, nothing moved. There was scarcely a car on the roads. All transport, everybody know this? Who's not old enough to remember it? All transport in the south of Ireland, public transport in the south of Ireland. The bus was stopped. The storage was closed. The railway stopped. There wasn't a plane landed at Dublin Airport because the workers wouldn't handle it. This was a huge, hotels were closed. I remember when I was driving around in Dundalk, actually, sort of rather weakly, I'd been out on the road for hours. I was looking for somewhere that might be open where I could get a cup of tea or something. Like that. And then I realised this is not good behaviour. You know, so I can go without a cup of tea. Nowhere was open. Nowhere was open. I was done. Whatever effect that had on the British authorities in the north, whatever import it made, it had a big effect on the political authorities in the south. A huge effect on the political authorities in the south. At least as big, bigger, I would think than sort of the reaction to the burning of the British Embassy at the time. It terrified the establishment that here was the biggest general strike since the general strike against conscription in 1918. That happened on the day after a, 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 a bloody Sunday. And so I got somewhere, there's a very impressive list that I wanted to uh, I mean, Oh yeah, the people, there was a convoy of state cars left Dublin to go to the bloody Sunday funerals of them, all showing the solidarity how much they cared, and so on. There was a, 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 a Thomas O'Brien Lenehan, personal representative of President David Lira, 32 backbench TDs were in Derry for the funerals, including Gareth Fitzgerald, Connor Cruz O'Brien, and Charlie Howe, 17 senators, the mayors of Park, Limerick, Waterford, Galway, Kilkenny, Drogheda, Sligo, Clomel, started all in their ceremonial robes, all marching, sort of along. There were 200 priests. There were eight bishops in the Craigan estate. I remember nobody from Derry could get into the church, including some of the relatives. I remember standing there, pouring rain, dreadful. I mean, I stand there, because there were 13 funerals, sort of insane. It took a long time. And also, this is vividly imprinted on my memory. And then we all went back uh, uh, to Dublin. What happened afterwards? Where was all this anger? Where was all this passion? What's the political implications of what was happening in the South? In the South, the political implications yeah, well, well, what actually happened is that in the day after that uh, uh, a funeral, I, uh, if I can find it here, the, the very day after the funeral, General O'Carroll, the chief, uh, the senior officer in the Irish Army, held a press conference and said that he wanted to assure the people that the force, the force was well equipped to deal with internal security. What sort of reaction is that to 13 deaths at the hands? Sort of, of the British Army. Are we are equipped to deal sort of, with internal uh, uh, security? On the day after they come back, there was a dog debate, naturally, sort of on uh, a bloody Sunday, uh, uh, Keyshawn Jack Lynch opened the debate by saying that there are men who, under the cloak of patriotism, throughout, sought to overthrow the institutions of this state. The institutions of this state will be held, uh, upheld without fear uh, or, 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 or favour. During the debate, somebody got up who was it? A Tom Fitzpatrick Fine Gael, told Desi O'Malley, the Justice Minister, that the planned recruitment of 600 extra guardie was no longer enough. After the scenes we have witnessed, sort of in the streets of our cities, we now want 2,000 guardie recruited, not 600. Then there was a Fianna Fowler, some lunatic idiot, but Sean Moore, some of you might remember, he thought not to be outdone. Started with these 2,000, he said not only should we recruit 2,000 guards, that they should have an immediate wage rise, and all outstanding grievances of members of the Guardi should be settled immediately, so that they were enthusiastic and ready for action. There was the result, sort of the political result, of what appeared to be just a justice campaign on both sides, as they say. Sort of what was happening with people drawing broader, a, a broader conclusion. If anybody wants to check it out three weeks later, there was the Finnegate, Fianna Fáil, they were the ruling party uh, a, at the time. Uh, they had the uh, uh, Fianna Fáil RDS out at the, RD, the RDS, and it was reported in Irish Times. Desi O'Malley got prolonged applause sort of, uh, when he said that there had been in the past while a number of northerners sort of acquitted 
in the courts in the south in dubious circumstances. This was actually true. You know, there were people charged with this and that in the south, and such was the atmosphere in the north, in the south and along the border, that they were left off. And all these cases will be retried under her, the three judge business that they had down here. They all have been tried on their juries. They were arresting you, and this time you're not going to get a jury. There is the tightening sort of, of the state machinery in relation to people supporting one. The face of it was just a campaign uh, uh, for justice. So if you look over and over again, so you can see, that would be quote from the newspapers and so forth. How quickly are all turned as soon as they saw these people demanding justice and the support that they are getting is actually threatening the stability and the institutions of the state. The institutions of the state that people bereaved over a road traffic accident also understood just sitting on the road in Donegal that it was called the, 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 the neutrality or the dependability of the institutions of the state were called uh, uh, into question. If you go in sort of an end sort of on this, you look at political reactions across the water. You might think that, uh, uh, that the only reaction sort of, of the British state, the British ruling class and its Tory government at the time, would be to defend the parties. They did do that. And Lord Savile's inquiry did do that as well. Sort of for reasons that I don't have time to go into, it's been healed. Sort of the very honest inquiry that found out the truth. No, it wasn't. It's a dishonest inquiry which avoided the truth. Anyway, so if you look at what the reaction of the British government was, because the minutes of uh, uh, a, a meeting on the 4th of February 1972, four days after uh, a bloody Sunday, five days after bloody Sunday, it's the Thursday, I don't know, whatever that is after a Sunday, so in which uh, representatives of the Northern Ireland government, the then Unionist government of Brian Faulkner, went over to London and had a meeting with the Northern Ireland subcommittee of the British uh, government. This included very important people, Leonard Heath, the Prime Minister, Reginald Modling, he was the Home Secretary, Lord Carrington, who was the uh, Foreign Secretary, uh, Lord uh, uh, Balney, who was the Minister of State for the Army at the Department of Defence. I mean, I could go through. Faulkner walked in, turned out a guy called Robert Ramsey, was his private secretary, whom I subsequently have gotten to know, turned for a curious way, turned about uh, talked to him, and also read the minutes uh, of the meeting. And what actually happened was that Edward Heath says, you know, this is a very worrying situation. Brian Faulkner said, indeed it is, we're very worried over in Belfast. He immediately said, Mr. Faulkner, it's not your government I'm worried about. It's the government of Mr. Lynch. Now think about that. As Jack Lynch and more gearing up the southern state in England, the British government could see what was happening. Now Mr. Lynch, I offered a series of things which are absolutely remarkable. He actually said to Faulkner, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll promise to maintain the border for 20 years. After that, We'll negotiate and see where we go uh, uh, forward. There's uh, also asked some poor old, I actually felt sorry for poor old Faulkner, reading all this stuff, and they said to him, Why do you want to hold on to uh, Derry and Tyrone anyway? We don't understand, and Yuri, could those not be ceded to the south? You know, and Faulkner patiently explained to them that if you did that, the question would arise of what you were going to do in Belfast where there were sort of nationalist areas, like the Ardoin and so forth, sort of which were sort of patterned through sort of the uh, Belfast. How could you actually deal with this? Hate of the people uh, uh, hadn't actually thought of this. Sort of, he said then there was going to be enforced power sharing. He said, you're going to have to have uh, nationalists in your government. Sort of Faulkner resisted uh, uh, that. He says, then we're going to have to have, uh, it's all hate in the British government, we're going to have to have some arrangements with the government of the South so that they can have a say to give confidence to the northern nationalists and so forth. What am I describing? All Ireland institutions, enforced power sharing uh, uh, in the north, referenda on the constitutional position. It's the Good Friday Agreement. It's the Good Friday Agreement. There it was, there it was in February 1972. So profoundly political and detailed political responses about the nature of the state and the interests of the British state, right, were sort of uh, uh, made at that time. And what point that I'm making is that the ruling class knows all this. They draw political conclusions about the nature of their state and the need to defend it. Individual people aggrieved by the denial of justice also draw conclusions from this. And the, the political point that I'm making is that when we take these things up, Sort of about to move into the evidence and inquest and all the rest of it, and are able to demonstrate the conclusion that a grave injustice has been done here, which ought to be put right. Sort of in the interest of decency and fairness and justice in society, ought to be put right. The other conclusion which we should draw at all times and spell out is that this tells us something important about the nature of the state, and it's because it's a capitalist state. 
because the state does not represent the mass of the people. That is why individual families are left without any redress and unable to recover sort of, from the grief sort of, of uh, what has been done to them. All this is political, just as everything is political, but this is acutely political and the only people, the only people who are going to consistently make that argument and make that point are those of us who see society in the first place as being divided into classes with antagonistic interests. And it's only in that intense emotional situation that that is brought to bear on individual instances of injustice. And you can see clearly that the ruling class doesn't care about the lives sort of, uh, uh, of ordinary citizens. That they lie and lie and lie again to defend the machinery of state. Therefore, when we take up individual campaigns to do with uh, justice in the face of the law, we are dealing sort of, with the most profound aspects of capitalism and therefore the most profound aspects of the perspective that we must have in order to overthrow capitalism. Thanks very much. Yeah, I was just going to say, it is interesting when you look at individual campaigns of justice, because sometimes people are, as Eamon said, rightly, rightly caught up in their own campaign, because it is uh, so deeply personal to them. And I think that as a socialist, you have to kind of understand that this person has a right to fight for their case. And at the same time, you've got to somehow bring it out and when you're talking to that person you say well you know you uh, you know i can see you know what's going on with your case and you support them and things like that and you try and bring them on to things and i often think that the best way of doing that is what the McBurty did is to connect people up is to connect other campaigns up and try and get them to uh, have a constant communication and a dialogue with each other um, if you see what's happening in a lot of countries now is People's mistrust, particularly around car accidents. Car accidents are massive. They're a massive area of uh, justice. But particularly around car accidents, a lot of people are installing what are known as OBDII cameras in their car, right? Now, for anyone who's not a mechanic, it's a little port beneath your steering wheel, right? And what it does is, it, it's like an, a, a black box in an airplane. If your car crashes, assuming that the uh, infrastructure of the car isn't completely destroyed, they can often tell exactly what the car was doing when it crashed. And a lot of people are actually now um, connecting these things, particularly people who have had instances where they've had to deal with the state, so that they have their own independent record of what's going on. You'll see it on YouTube, you know, you type in Russian car camps, because people so mistrust the Russian police that any time they have an interaction with the Russian police, they're filming it. Look at, look at the guys up in Mayo. Huge amount of them have put in dashboard cams now so that they can film what the police are doing. And in some ways, that level of filming and level of technology, which Joan Burton, by the way, alluded to when she was talking about people's expensive phones, has made the administration of justice harder for them to cover up. Um, I'll give a, another example. Did any of you see the footage on YouTube of the police leaving the woman in the bus lane? In Northern Ireland, the police officer in Northern Ireland left a woman lying in a bus lane, in a bus lane, unconscious. Now, if you had said that a couple of years ago without video evidence, people would have went, you're mad. The police didn't do that. That's mad. But when you see the evidence of it and you see the, um, the, the way that this is, is actually now becoming clearer and clearer and the transparency of it. And um, but my, the point I want to make is that these things are covered up for political expediency. They, they're usually covered up to protect the people in power. Um, I'll give an example, the final example I'll give is from, uh, from Dublin itself, the Stardust Fire. Why was the Stardust Fire never properly investigated? Because when Fianna Fáil first found out about the Stardust Fire, before they cancelled their Ardesh, they checked to see if all their members were still alive. The reason they checked to see if all their members were still alive was a lot of their members were at a trade union function in a thing called the Lampreys, which was above the Stardust. A lot of their members were actually in the Stardust when it burned and were the first to leave and were told by um, one of the bouncers there who, was, who worked with us on the Stardust campaign, was told by the bouncer to leave the area, to run, so that they wouldn't be seen to be there. Now, there has, there has never been a list made of 
who left that area. There's never been a listen aid. So we don't know who in Fianna Fáil was there, what they were negotiating or deal they were doing with the trade union members who were there who also left. And we'll never know. We can never prove it. We can speculate all we want. I'm sure it wasn't in our interest. Um, but these things are covered up, not for conspiratorial reasons in the sense that they want to, um, to crush people. They want to save themselves. And often when they do come up with something like the Bloody Sunday Tribunal or uh, the declaration in the Dáil that the, um, uh, that the cause of the Stardust was unknown, they often leave it hanging in the air. And as Eamon said, there are other questions then that come out of those conclusions that they never answer, and they never will, until we can get these particular campaigns for justice to come together and to, to fight a common cause. And I think that a lot of that uh, could be done you know, uh, as a campaign for justice. I don't know how we could do it you know, ourselves, but I think that you know, it's something that if we could push forward, particularly on the car accident stuff, you know, we could make a huge impact, both personally for people and politically. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Eamon spoke uh, very eloquently about uh, one of the greatest injustices in the history of the North, obviously, uh, Bloody Sunday. And, you know, there were a whole raft of in state perpetrated injustices in that era, you know, Bloody Sunday, internment without trial, shoot to kill, and so on and so forth. Um, but there is a propaganda put out there by the Northern State today that as bad as those things may have been, even to the degree that they might even accept them, they are now so-called legacy issues that uh, the state uh, maybe has to deal with the past, but that repression no longer exists. But I would argue that, you know, and, and they would say, well, you know, the reason for that is we now have a settlement in the north. We have the Belfast uh, Agreement. But I would argue that the mm -hmm. Belfast Agreement hasn't settled anything. And because it hasn't settled anything um, and hasn't dealt with sectarianism, in order to deal with those problems, the state is, to uh, echo Eamon, uh, beginning to uh, tighten the screws uh, again. Um, we don't have internment without trial in the way maybe we had in the 70s, but people might have seen the case of Marion Price, who was put into prison without trial, without uh, a court case, wasn't told what the evidence was, uh, just by the decision of the Secretary of uh, State. We saw recently even the case of uh, Gary Donnelly, who is a councillor, who's a Republican, what they would call a dissident Republican, who's going to jail for six months for graffiti and has been told that he's going to lose his seat and won't be allowed to stand for five years uh, because of it. And imagine, comrades, uh, you know, a number of our councillors in the South have been arrested over the water charges. Imagine the state was able to turn around and say, right, these are all banned from standing for the next uh, five years. We've seen with the Twidale camp in North Belfast, how uh, they've used that, a very unpopular and a very sectarian camp, but how they've used it, Sinn Féin are now proposing, Sinn Féin and an, and an SDLP MLA have proposed that in future uh, protesters should have to pay to protest, should have to pay for the police operation, or at least part of the police operation, and if there's any violence or any rats, um, that they have to uh, pay the cost for that. Now again, imagine the unionist government in the 1960s were able to say that to the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association that you're liable for all the rats, you're liable to pay for these protests. So the Special Powers Act might be gone, but there are a whole series of new special powers emerging, a whole new series of repressive measures in the North emerging. And I think we have to be very, very clear. We have no truck with the Todell camp. We don't agree with dissident republicanism or armed struggle. We have no time for any of that. But when the state is uh, repressing people, we have to be very, very clear and, uh, and against it. There is no contradiction in us standing up and saying we're against a return to armed struggle, but we're not for internment of Republicans. There's no contradiction in us saying that we have no time for electing uh, you know, uh, Republicans or whatever to Derry City Council, but we're not going to allow the state to dictate who can be elected and who can't, because they echo something that Brian used against the left. So we have to be very clear. We have to be against the tournament without trial. We have to protest against the, this ridiculous notion that people should have to pay to, pro to protest. Uh, and we have to fight for real justice, not just for the people in the past, uh, because there really are still issues to be dealt with, but fight against the special uh, powers uh, today. Comrades, I'm sure you'll be very impressed to know that I'm an officer of the court. It means that I'm a, it means I'm a barrister in London. 
it therefore means that I spend my time wearing a very, very silly outfit, talking very, very silly language, and watching poor, black, working class, and exploited and oppressed people getting sent to prison for not being able to pay bills, for uh, having to engage in theft, or being addicted to drugs, and so on. That's the justice that working class people get in our society. But th that's not really what I wanted to talk to you about. I wanted to say something about a campaign that some of you will probably know about, the Stephen Lawrence family campaign. The campaign they found him, him, their son and brother, Stephen Lawrence, 18 year old black kid, murdered, and it's officially acknowledged, murdered in a racist attack, unprovoked racist attack. The family fought, that was in 1993, the family fought and demanded justice. Eamon talked about a wall of silence, and the police claimed there was a wall of silence around the killing of Stephen Lawrence. In fact, within hours, they had been given by dozens of people the names of the people who had been proved to be responsible for that murder. But it took until 2012 for that family to get anybody convicted of that murder. Two things I wanted to say about that. The Daily Mail newspaper for strange reasons, latched onto the family in 1997, put a headline calling the perpetrators murderers and challenging them to sue the, uh, the police. And when the Lawrence family finally got two of the killers put behind bars in 2012, the Daily Mail editor, a guy called Paul Dacre, said in an editorial that he, that he believes that that family would not have got justice had it not been for the Daily Mail publishing that headline in 1997. I think actually that is a travesty of justice because that not only, it wasn't simply that the Daily Mail was nowhere between 1993 when Stephen Lance was killed and 1997. In actual fact, they were sending reporters into the campaign that the family set up in order to write smear stories and to discredit that family. And the reason why, and this is, this is important, the reason why the family was able to get a campaign, to keep a campaign going was, and they admit this for two reasons. Firstly, when Nelson Mandela, newly released from prison, came over and pledged support for the family. But secondly, when Neville Lawrence, the father of Stephen, went to the Trade Union Congress and appealed for support from the Trade Union Movement and was given unconditional support from the Trade Union Movement for working class people. That came about precisely because people who have been involved in the Bloody Sunday, his history of Bloody Sunday, people who have been involved in the travesty that happened around Hillsborough, the football a tragedy, people from Liverpool, saw the injustice that the Lawrence family were experiencing and identified it, saw that it was the same struggle that they had been through and therefore went round, petitioned, took a collection in their workplaces, passed resolutions in their union branches and forced the trade union movement to back that fam family. That's what real solidarity, that's what delivering real justice is really all about. And it was for those reasons that the family were able to keep going, not just until 1997, but right the way through to 2012 and get not real justice, they won't get Stephen Lawrence back, but at least <coughs> some modicum of comfort seeing at least two of his killers behind bars. There is a postscript to this story, which is this. It was revealed last year that not simply the Daily Mail were sending reporters in to try and discredit the family, but that the Metropolitan Police, the institutionally racist institution that had failed to investigate Stephen's murder, had sent spies into the family campaign, bugging legally privileged discussions between lawyers and their clients in order to dig dirt and to discredit Stephen, the family of Stephen Lawrence. Not just the family of Stephen Lawrence, incidentally, environmental activists, anti-racist campaigns. It was discovered, for example, that police officers had slept with, and in some cases had children with political campaigners involved in environmental and political campaigns and so on. That is the, the, the extent to which the state is prepared to go in order to discredit people who fight for justice. And the proof that, you know, that, that should prove, if, if anyone needs proof to us that real justice doesn't come through going to the courts and expecting them to deliver it for us, it comes through building support and solidarity from the bottom up, ultimately, of course, fighting for a completely different society.
Okay, so I'm just going to go off a wee bit. And um, there's a, one individual case that's become a part of Irish history now, and that would be the death of Savita Halapanaba. And I have to say that it was because her family, her uh, widower and her friends, wanted justice in that case that that name ever came to light and ever became a part of our history. And when Sabita died in that hospital, in Galway Hospital, her family went from pillar to post saying, we think something's happened here that was wrong. They wanted justice and you know, they were getting nowhere. They went to the guards and the guards said, oh wait for the coroner's inquest. Now the coroner's inquest would have been a very, very different state of affairs if Sabita's family and friends hadn't come along to a campaign group. Mm -hmm. And the campaign group they came to was Galway Pro-Choice. Mm -hmm. And in that group was a lot of activists that are in this room today and at this meeting this weekend. And I honestly think that if that case hadn't been handled correctly, it would never come to light. Mm -hmm. The reason it was handled properly is because our network of activists was able to give it to the right journalist that could expose what happened in this case in the broader context of what was happening to women in this country because the state had sat on, leg uh, it hadn't legislated for the exhibition for 20 years and this is what was happening to women. We don't know how many other women this sort of thing had happened to but it was in pursuit of justice for one woman that this came to light. And so since then, the whole case of Savita has become a piece of our history, as I've said. And they went on and in the end, we did have to get some sort of legislation, but we know it still isn't good enough. But the thing is, when you're looking at who's to blame for this, we're not, nobody's sort of like saying, right, look at those that sat on this legislation for 20 years, but we are. But you know what I mean, the powers that be aren't saying, well, we sat on this, so therefore we're to blame. And nobody's looking at the fact that the state allowed church ethos to dominate in, in our hospitals for all those years and still allows it to do so. I mean, at the minute, yeah, there's going to be disciplinary inquiries into the individuals. So once again, they're trying to scapegoat the individuals. But it's the whole thing of the state. It's the whole thing of them denying us our rights and denying us our justice. So I just wanted to use that as one more example of what we get up to. <laughs> last November and he just covered every the amount of campaigns he got involved in using his own experience. But I suppose that, um, for me, like when you look at why the, the whole thing around capitalism and money making and everything, and for me it's around <coughs> insurance and insurance companies and the madness that has happened now where you're told if you have a car accident, don't apologise to the person you've run into because you won't get you won't get your insurance or you won't you can't even visit them in hospital or anything like that. And you look at the whole range of people who've taken cases, have taken the government to court, like uh, parents of children with disabilities, especially in order to bring um, to, to get education for their children, insurance companies get involved in that, they end up doing huge payouts, they have C victims and physiostomy. All, of the, all of these people are fighting for, injusti for, for justice and I think at the heart of, of fighting for justice is inequality and I think that, that that's something, it's really frustrating when people are resorting to looking for payment and insurance to compensate them for something that we can provide at, 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 you know, through the state and that. And I suppose, I just, just think that the insurance companies are making a fortune out of this uh, out of injustice and out of inequality. I think that's a disgrace. Thank you very much. Yeah, if we just, if we take one practical application of the fantastic insight that Eamon and all the speakers have given about how justice will not be delivered to the institutions of the state, legal, uh, the, and, and by the, the police or by the Dáil. And I'd say everyone here who's been involved in a campaign has had people say, you know, we should challenge that legally, we should challenge that in the courts, and where does that get us? It gets us nowhere. So all the people who are involved in campaigns, the current one, the, uh, the, the Right to Water campaign, we see how the uh, justice has been meted out. You can't, uh, people protesting against the water meters, you can't stand within 20, 20 meters of the, uh, the company putting in the water meters. 
And you have to think back, who are the people who are putting forward the idea to go down the legal route? Yeah. They're the people who don't want real change. Mm. They want to, uh, what's the word, wallpaper over the cracks. Yeah. We are the people here, the Right to Water campaign, and all the other campaigns that are going to come up here, we want to sweep the shit, excuse me, no. we have to sweep those corrupt, uh, unfair, uh, groups of people out of our society and we have to be the people who are actually going to say we know what our lives should be let's go out and get it for ourselves so therefore it's really important that you join a group like the Socialist Workers Party who are out there who have the analysis and can spot it a mile away when you have somebody in there putting out a false yeah. prophecy I suppose and so join the Socialist Workers Party <laughs> Miscarriages of justice that are ongoing. Sean had what I meant to mention, but forgot. And that's the Quake Avon 2 in the north. And people probably haven't heard about them an awful lot because there's been very little reporting um, in the papers. But basically, these are two people from a distant Republican organisation who've been framed for the murder of a policeman. And there's real, when I say that, I mean, I can say it with as much confidence as we used to say it about the Birmingham 6 or the Guildford 4. Um, for example, there was a tracking device in their car. Um, they, the cops have said that the tracking device places them, you know, at, or the prosecution said it places them um, at the site of the murder, and yet the traffic de tracking, tracking device was turned off for hours at a time. You know, just happened, the data happened to go missing, that kind of thing. So it's a really, um, it's becoming a bigger issue in the north, and it's certainly something that um, socialists are going to need to take up, to be honest with you. Uh, we haven't been as quick about taking it up as we might be because it's the case in the north, just as it was at the time of the Birmingham 6 or the Guildford 4, that the minute you say that's a miscarriage of justice, we need to stand with those people, you then get, you know, uh, tarred with the brush of the dissidents. In the way in the 1970s or the 80s, we'd have been tarred as being provos because we were standing up for the Birmingham 6 um, or the Guildford 4, or just like our comrades in Egypt are tarred as being Muslim Brotherhood supporters when actually what they're doing is standing up um, for the rights of uh, the, um, the, the, the people who've been jailed un unfairly and end up in jail themselves. So I think that if our comrades in Egypt can risk jail for standing up for basic human rights, we can certainly um, risk being tarred as dissidents for doing that. And it's something that over the next wee while, um, comrades from the north will be talking to people in the south, you know, about maybe getting people for profit councillors and people like that on board to try to have a campaign that's coming from the left to say free the Craig Evans too um, you know rather than leaving it entirely uh, just to the, um, the the traditional republicans as you might as you might call it. I just wanted to make a make a point to you that I am not sure um anyone was talking about this it's it's uh, it's possible to draw revolutionary conclusions from that direct experience uh, of injustice. But I think we have to also also be uh, I think a bit careful about how that can also the state can also use inquiries sometimes as a way of acting as a shock, shock absorber for the system and as a way of uh, putting, uh, of uh, directing that in a reformist direction. And I think you think about the tra trajectory that the provisionals, for example, and their response to Bloody Sunday, for example, for a long time, the provisionals' response to, to, to Bloody Sunday was to say this shows that the reason why we need to have an armed struggle against this state because it's rotten, corrupt, uh, it, it will use violence against us and we're entirely justified in using violence against it. But as the provisionals underwent that transition to accommodating the state and setting up the peace process and so on, the demand for Bloody Sunday inquiry just became seen as a bargaining chip in that process of, of negotiation, this is something that you will give to the, the nationalist community, that you know, the Blair uh, will give to the, to the nationalist community, uh, in return for you know, sort of for them for, for them signing up. And I think you see the whole the whole nature of the the bloody Southern inquiry uh, it's, itself. Very very early on, the uh, the lawyers for for the British Army admitted that everybody was innocent. They were not prepared to, to, to defend uh, the fact that the people killed, killed you know or you know uh, were carrying guns or anything like that. But what they spent the inquiry doing was trying to criminalise the struggle that was going on by saying there were guns in the area. Imagine that, that was, you know, that shows that there was some, some underhand thing and, you know, that it was understandable that why, the, uh, why, why the government reacted the way it did. And I think it just means that I think we have to be, as revolutionaries, we have to be, you know, sort of emphasise that other side of thing that, 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 that Eamon mentioned. You know, what, what Bloody Sunday was about 
was about the state using violence to terrify a mass movement off, off the street. The reaction to it, the general strike in the South and all that sort of stuff, the longshoremen who went on strike in, in, in America and so on, in solidarity and so on, terrified the British and Irish uh, ruling classes. That's the conclusion we need to draw. And at a time now, when you look at what's happened with Boris Sunday, now that Sinn Féin and the SDLP have completely gone along with David Cameron's uh, thing about, you know, we made an apology, we said they were innocent, that's the end of it, and said that they don't want, there's no need to march anymore, there's nothing else to be pursued. Well, at the time when they've done that, the, and still some of the families are insisting on, on, on march, and I think socialists are absolutely right to, uh, to do that. Some people, the dissident, dissident Republicans, would draw the conclusion and say, OK, Sinn Féin have sold out, we need to continue the armed struggle, but we need to fight for a revolutionary Marxist uh, conclusion about that. They said, no, the thing that really threatened the ruling class were th things like the general strikes, and that's what we need to you know, build on those uh, uh, revolutionary Marxist politics uh, 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 and provide that alternative. Just to start, we're calling in that uh, up there. Uh, I hope, if it's possible, there was a long way to go. Started that uh, we we'll have a few people up for the annual Bloody Sunday March, or on the last Sunday on January, as always, was a bit of the 28th. Uh, and just sort of echoing some of the things that I was uh, uh, saying, uh, that sort of weekend of uh, discussions and uh, about international matters and about Kregatham too, for example, there will be a session uh, on that on Saturday afternoon. But we have a rally in which uh, one, a, a, one of the main speakers will be Mozam Bay. He's coming over Mozam, of course, was a, a prisoned in Guantanamo Bay, and it was released after three years. Uh, he was then arrested on his return from Syria. Uh, well, actually, he was so law abiding, Mozam, he had told the special branch before he went to Syria. Because he knew I could be in trouble here, that he was going to Syria and exactly what he was going to do and when he would be back, which is when they knew when he was coming back. Very back, they arrested him. They were charged with consorting with terrorists, put him in Belmarsh Prison, a high security prison where he remained for seven months before the case came to court, which the prosecution got up and admitted that they had no evidence. Not a little bit of evidence which wasn't enough to convict him, admitted they had no evidence. So he was released after that, he's coming over here to speak about Bloody Sunday and sort of the connections between uh, I, all the uh, struggles in the world. Uh, I, Claire Bailey will be speaking sort of up from Dublin, and we hope, Claire, some of our North American friends are here sort of about this, and we hope that we're going to have uh, a speaker from Ferguson in Missouri, sort of with the campaign in Derry, sort of just as a bit of about enough money uh, to bring somebody over from the States. If we do that, we'll be looking for other meetings. Sort of a, a that person who goes sort of to uh, uh, other places. But the, what I'm talking about sort of is Ferguson, uh, 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 Guantanamo, and the sort of persecution of the oppression sort of, of Muslim people, and Bloody Sunday. Sort of, and in a way, sort of, there you have sort of I mean, basic internationalism, just done in a practical way. Because they don't even have to, well, they will, sort of refer to one another's struggles, just being there together, sort of, in that particular day, sort of makes a political point more eloquently, perhaps, than any of us could make it. Uh, uh, a singly sort of uh, a, a, a by ourselves. And Colm's absolutely right, I just didn't have time to go into this, I think it's sort of about the way in which sort of the Savile report was used to consolidate the peace agreement, uh, the Good Friday Agreement, the peace process as they call it, sort of uh, 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 it was to go on forever. You know, uh, the peace process, it will actually, it will actually, none of you people will still be alive whenever the peace process is over because it suits certain people uh, to keep the process going uh, uh, and say, don't you dare attack us for such and such and such and such because uh, you'll ruin the peace process. Like, you know, uh, Jerry Adams says all the time, go hold the peace process and says, go on, hit me now, I'm holding the baby. You know, it's hard. It's, a, uh, it's like that. Uh, a, it's like that. And actually, sort of, when it comes to a big controversy, I see it rightly so over this ad, which is on television, about uh, 1916. Sort of which will lead you to believe that 1916 was an able people to make sort of rousing dippity dee music, sort of, and all the rest of it, sort of, and found factories and people put the edge of technology, all that bolder that sort of as a actually, sort of, there's a, 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 an interesting and bitter letter row going on in the area about the installation of a stained glass window in the Guildhall building uh, to commemorate Bloody Sunday. And as it stands at the minute, there are four panels, and the one thing missing from it is anything to do with shooting. Anything to do with shooting, or 
resonant. The only reference to it really sort of is a stained glass representation of the crowd outside the guild hall when Lord Sattle brought his report and everybody's clapping sort of, and they're all smiling. That's the conclusion that they draw. They're happy ending, matter over, stop whinging and whining about it, you know, and that's because it is a sculpture, it's part of the settlement. Part of the settlement and actually sort of the, the, the appointment of uh, a, an inquiry into Bloody Sunday in 1998, 1999, sorry, January uh, 1999, sorry, well, January 1998, uh, 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 there were just a few months before the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, not by coincidence. Sort of that was negotiated between the Dublin government of Bertie Ahern sort of, and the London government of uh, uh, Tony Blair. And it was part of the settlement. You give us that inquiry and we give you such and such. Nothing to do with justice, nothing at all to do with justice, to do with the political needs uh, uh, of the two sides. And that's the thing, they don't want any other. And today, so because there is, and there's a minority of the families, they're saying we're marching on, we want these guys charged. If the state kills sort of uh, citizens, it must be held to account. You know, sorry, if somebody is murdered and it's decided that they're not going to be investigated for murder, what does that say about the victim? That's really saying that the victim's less than human. You know, we're not having that. We're not allowing them just to go that far and uh, uh, to go no further. And an awful lot of other people, particularly those people who are in, uh, influenced by Sinn Féin, sort of are saying, let it go now, let it go, draw a line under it. And what you get, sort of, there yeah, is people going around doors with bloody Sunday families. And say we're here to talk to you sort of about the Bloody Sunday thing. Look, we're not going to do any better than this. This is as good as it gets. We have to give up. We can pat ourselves on the back, sort of, that we've done quite well, very well, sort of, on this issue. Don't be pressing uh, a for any more. It's going to be disruptive and wrestling. It's actually a campaign door to door, been organised by uh, Sinn Féin, sort of, and others sort of who agree with them, uh, uh, to be fair. And so, on. so that battle, sort of, for the truth, is a battle which is intensely political, and where you stand on it depends on where you stand, sort of, on the, the uh, uh, pattern of the settlement which has been negotiated between the British uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the Irish governments. And now that's sort of the, the, the that charge of internationalism, sort of that current of internationalism, which is run through, which implicitly run through, which is going to be represented, hopefully by somebody from Ferguson and by Mozambique uh, uh, in Derry at the end uh, uh, of January. Again, you know, sort of, you can preach to people sort of about internationalism right throughout the campaign before some people decided that it's over and there's no need for it anymore. Every year on a bloody Sunday platform, and I spoke at a, a, at a couple of them, people talked about Palestine. They talked sort of about uh, the murder of African Americans and the rest of it. So they talked about sort of the Aboriginal people in Australia. All that with the common currency of it, all that's gone because I mean you can't keep talking about that in relation to Bloody Sunday and at the same time say Bloody Sunday is settled and, uh, uh, and all the rest of it. And what I'm going to do just to air, sort of with, I mean I wrote a little bit which is, a, a, you're plugging that little book sort of go on the parties, which is about sort of the limitations mainly, it's only a little pamphlet, uh, about the limitations of uh, Lord Savile's report, sort of on the politics of those who say that this is a full and fair settlement and we don't have to talk again. Sort of a, but, and I sort of ended this uh, uh, pamphlet sort of with the series. It's just sort of jumbled quotations from the people, sort of a little committee that we have, which is organising sort of the annual commemoration. Uh, 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 now, sort of about why are we doing it? Sort of, and I didn't intend to do this at the time, sort of, but when we were sitting and talking, so sort of, as you do, we hold the meetings around Betty Doherty's table, and then the end, usually we get about half an hour's work done, and it takes three hours, because an awful lot of it is, what's the gossip start, you know, so it's very difficult to uh, give uh, it. But anyway, sort of, I, I, I took these sort of snatches of uh, what people were saying, and just ran them into a paragraph, and I'm going to finish uh, a, a like this. The resonance of Bloody Sunday with events in the wider world today echoes the association of free dairy with campaigns and uprisings of the oppressed a generation ago. That's a reference to the black civil rights movement, the Vietnam War movement, the student occupations and the rest of it, back in that period uh, a, a, of the late 60s and early, uh, a, and early 70s. Uh, to break that link between Derry sort of, and all those things happening, to break that link, to proclaim that the bog side has gotten most of what it wanted and that there's no need for marching anymore, is to deny the appeals to internationalism which regularly rang from Bloody Sunday platforms over the long years when it was assumed that the chances of the campaign gaining anything at all were remote. It is to belittle the magnitude of the atrocity, 
to diminish the grandeur of the struggle for justice, to deny the class nature of the killings, to load guilt, to load guilt onto the lower orders by allowing the upper echelons to shrug off all responsibility, to narrow the relevance of the issues arising, and most and worst of all, to shut our eyes to what we share with people who have a longer way to travel towards the truth than we have. The search for the truth about Bloody Sunday is not a matter to be resolved, merely to the satisfaction of the British ruling class or to suit the political needs of the leaders of Irish nationalist parties. The struggle isn't over. There are Bloody Sunday journeys everywhere which remain to be completed. That's the, the, the sense in which sir, we have to understand the continuing campaign for the truth about Bloody Sunday. That is implicit sir, that every campaign for justice which involves sort of the actions of the state against uh, uh, individuals. So when we take up these cases, as we sort of said a, a, a from the program, when we take up these cases, we are not only attempting to assist and to win justice and the truth for individuals. I always say it again, that's a good enough reason. As far as I'm concerned, that that's all you've got. But it's not adequate. It's not an adequate reason. Sort of, and that's where socialist ideas a, a come in. Sort of, and, and, and sometimes you're told, well, don't be bringing up all that politics. What we want is justice here. What we want is the truth. We want everybody involved. We want unity in the campaign. Well, you can go along with a campaign like that as long as you're saying for yourself, your party, so as long as you're continually making the case sort of the justice in a particular instance, so it is not good enough, including not good enough, sort of for the people involved in that first uh, in that first instance. So the call for justice, the cry for justice, in the end, is a cry for the end of the capitalist system. That is to say, it is a central part of the struggle for socialism. Thanks very much.